Well, let's do pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to explore what you have done and what, are, and what you are doing. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you'd open all of this to our lives, that we might behold the great gift you've given us as we commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory, the Overcomer's Handbook. That's the book that my wife and I have just completed. These are several studies in support of and expanding some of the thoughts in that book. And we're going to explore Thy Kingdom Come, Part 2. And uh, just by way of review from the previous session, we pray, Thy Kingdom Come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in, in the Lord's Prayer. And yet many people don't really realize, what is it that we're praying for? Thy Kingdom Come. What are we talking about here? And uh, the whole idea here is to rightly divide the word of truth. Mark, Luke, and John use the term the kingdom of God. But Matthew uniquely uses a term the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he does it 33 times, but not exclusively. Sometimes he also uses the kingdom of God. And the point being, these are not synonymous. Many people presume they are, but we know that they're not, that uh, Matthew is just being more denotative, more precise. Kingdom of God is everything outside God himself, everything he's created, long before the earth, long before the universe, the angels, what have you. But here we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. In fact, it's the kingdom from heaven, from and of are identical words in both the Hebrew and in German. And when you say the kingdom from, you're talking about a genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. In other words, it's not, when you say kingdom of heaven, we get confused and ascribe that to being heaven. No, it's a kingdom from heaven that we're dealing with. It's a kingdom on the earth. And so that's what we're going to explore. And we discover the kingdom, the kingdom of God is always seven, seven churches, seven whatever. The kingdom of heaven is always twelves. There are twelve tribes. There are twelve apostles that will rule over those twelve tribes. There are twelve kingdom of heaven parables. There are twelve kingdom mysteries. There are twelve thousand sealed from each of the twelve tribes. And when we get to the New Jerusalem, we discover it has 12 gates and 12 foundation stones. And its size is apparently 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000 furlongs, cubically, if you will. So the point is we're going to explore the millennium. That was promised to David in 2 Samuel and was reconfirmed under oath in Psalm 80. It was predicted all through the Psalms and the prophets. It was promised to Mary in the New Testament. And in the Lord's Prayer, of course, we pray that thy kingdom come. It shows up many places. And uh, that Jesus Christ is going to rule. That's a fulfillment of the trialogue between the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost that makes up Psalm 2. He's going to rule with a rod of iron, and before him every knee shall bow. That's literally on the earth. There are over 1,800 uh, references to, in the Old Testament alone. 17 books give promise to the event. Three, over 300 references in the New Testament. 216 chapters focus on this. 23 of the 27 books that make up the New Testament give prominence to the event of Christ ruling on the planet Earth. And for every prophecy of his first coming that we celebrate, there are at least eight of his second coming. So as we study the Bible, by way of review, just to get warmed up from our previous session, there are four unconditional covenants. The Abrahamic covenant, the land covenant, sometimes called the Palestinian covenant in some Bibles, the Davidic covenant, and the everlasting covenant that gives the New Testament its name. It's interesting that each one of these are challenged. The Ab Abrahamic covenant is challenged by the world in general. All anti-Semitism has its roots, in effect, in the Abrahamic covenant. The land covenant is the primary challenge of Islam. It's not the size of Israel that's a problem, it's the existence of Israel. And the Davidic covenant, strangely, is challenged by the church. Most Traditional churches that come from the Reformation um, have a, a, a view that really denies the reality of the Davidic covenant. And that's what we're focusing on these, in this series. The announcement to, to uh, Mary by uh, Gabriel in Luke chapter 1. He shall be called great. He shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him, what? The throne of his pro of father David. That did not exist during the Roman period during which the ministry, Christ's ministry took place. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared before the, for you before the, from the foundation of the world. 
So we're talking about a kingdom on the earth. At the Council for Jerusalem, the pivotal event in the book of Acts, uh, James, Christ's uh, uh, brother, said, Simeon, or Simon, had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And he then quotes Amos 9, verse 11 and 12. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again on the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. That's all. That's the book of Acts. This is, these are New Testament references. The throne of David will be reestablished in Jerusalem. And this is also emphasized to Abraham, interestingly, in Genesis 17. David himself to rule, indeed. Four times in, uh, uh, in the scriptures, it, it identifies the ruler then as David himself, the resurrected David. And, uh, and th- all of this cannot be applied to the church for lots of reasons. That's emphasized in Ezekiel 37. But this whole time, the millennium, is going to include profound changes on the planet Earth. And it's all through the Old Testament. Very amplified. Well, as we always study these things, you know, Jesus pointed his four disciples on the Mount of Olives to the last four verses of Daniel 9 as the key to end time prophecy. And we've been through this, of course, this whole idea that in Daniel verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 25, it predicts the precise day that Jesus would present himself as the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. And that occurred on April 6th of 32 AD, the exact day that Gabriel predicted. And that was predicted over three centuries before the gospel period. Most phenomenal passage in the Bible. But we are really now in this interval between verse 25 and verse 27. Verse 26 is an interval, a gap. After the 69 weeks, several things are going to occur. Namely, Jesus will be crucified. That's predicted there. And the the city will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. But, and that's at least 38 years of history, but we've experienced it's actually taken two, over, you know, essentially 2,000. We're primarily focusing on the most documented period of time in the Bible, that is verse 27, the so-called 70th week, the missing week. We would assume they're contiguous, except that, that verse 26 makes it quite clear that after the verse, at verse 25, there's a series of events that occur before verse 27 even begins. So that's, a, that's something that's critical to understanding here. But focusing on the 70th week of Daniel, moving right in here, we, we're in the middle of the interval commit, coming up near the end of it. And we know that there will be the harpazo, the rapture. And it's some distance prior to the beginning of that 70th week because the, this coming world leader won't be revealed until the rapture. Once he's revealed, he has to rise to be powerful enough to enforce a covenant for the seven years that defines the 70th week. We don't know if that's one hour or 30 years. Who knows? That's an undefined interval. But then we have this week during which he enforces a covenant. In the middle of that, he violates that covenant, establishing an event called the abomination of desolation. And Jesus, and, and we know that that's right in the middle of that week. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's mentioned three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. In fact, the Lord himself labels the last half of that seven-year period the Great Tribulation. That label comes from him quoting Matthew, uh, in Matthew 24, he quotes Daniel 12 to give it that label. Okay, and that, that time of trouble gets intense enough to where it finally leads to the Battle of Armageddon, which is interrupted by the Lord's return. He gathered his, the, the church, if you will, up in the rapture of Arpazzo, and he brings them back at his coming in power. And so there's really two comings that we're expecting. He comes in secret for his church, and then he comes with his church in in power to set up his kingdom. And that's when he sets up that that, that period. We have a sheep and goat judgment, marriage supper, and then the great white throne at the end of the thousand years. This is obviously not to scale. During that thousand years, Satan is bound. At the end of that thousand years, he's released for a a little season. But uh, we have the great white throne judgment, then a new heavens and a new earth, and then the new Jerusalem is, comes upon the earth. And so this strange period we call the millennium, the thousand-year period, is a focus of what we call the kingdom. And uh, it's interesting that all, there's a huge amount of events that occur for a thousand years of history between a second coming and new heavens and new earth. Don't confuse those two events. There's a, they're separated by a thousand years. So the millennium. 
The creation itself appears to have changed. Physical changes are described in Zechariah 4 and Isaiah 35 and elsewhere. Apparently the curse, at least in part, is lifted according to Isaiah 11. The creation is redeemed. The events of Genesis 3 are uh, dealt with as Paul indicates in Romans chapter 8. The earth then is in full knowledge of the Lord. After a thousand years of full knowledge of the Lord, we still blow it because when Satan's loose, there's still a rebellion. But all of this is still not eternity. Don't confuse it with eternity. Death and sin are still available during that uh, thousand years. Each there will have land and be fruitful and there's a lot. It's, it's still a, an economy on the planet earth. Don't confuse it with heaven itself. It has some strange limitations during the millennium. It's not heaven. It's not, don't confuse it with the eternal state that follows with the new heavens and new earth. It's not the new earth. Isaiah 65, 66. In fact, most of what we know about the millennium is from the Old Testament, not the new. Second Peter 3 deals with that. And of course, Revelation from after chapter 20, where, namely chapter 21, 22, deal with this. This is not where righteousness dwells. That's yet coming. There's a limited amount of evil, but it's judged immediately according to Isaiah 11 and other passages. So let's again look at these order of events here. That's what we're looking at uh, here. We have all kinds of charts and diagrams of what goes on on the earth during that period from the Harpazzo, the abomination of desolation, all the way through to the thousand years, the great white throne. What's going on in heaven between the Harpazzo and his second coming? We're apparently up there for at least seven years of earth time. What's going on there? Well, one of the most, the first things is the, that happens after the Harpazzo is the Bema Seat Judgment. And uh, that's the one we'll focus on just briefly here. Now, as we do this, we, of course, encounter a basic doctrinal division that's gone on for over 400 years from the Calvinists who embrace a form of eternal security and a number of other views that we've talked about. Arminians who believe that only those that persevere to the end are saved. Both of these views, which are at war with each other for four centuries, are correct in what they assert, but wrong in what they deny. There is a third view, and that's what we're presenting here, that I'll call, for lack of a better term, the overcomer's view, which embraces the concept of eternal security in the sense of justification, 100% done by Christ, and if you're saved... You can't lose your salvation or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all muff their missions. And, and uh, I encourage you to check that out in our special study on eternal security. Let's stipulate that for here. But what the overcoming view leans on is a distinction between entering heaven and inheriting. Uh, your inheritance is something that is forfeit or can be forfeit. Inheritance is lost in the Old Testament and also the New. So part of this is to recognize what we're dealing with here is not whether or not you're saved. That's taken for granted if you're, if you're in Christ. So we're going to take a look at the, the fact that the, as far as your inheritance is concerned, there's a high variation of rewards. Not everybody is equal. Some get into heaven by the skin of their teeth because Jesus paid the price and that's it. But others who uh, really uh, have a, a persevering life of faith they have rewards. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We must all, no exceptions. That, and he's speaking to people who are saved. All of us who are saved will appear before the judgment seat. Don't confuse that with the great white throne judgment which occurs at the end of the thousand years. We'll get to that in a minute. In 1 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 11, it details the procedure or the, what's going to be going on before that judgment seat. Paul says, For other foundation can no man lay in that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, and he lists two groups of things, gold, silver, precious stones, those are inflammable, and wood, hay, stubble, they're flammable. Then he goes on to explain, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, I was using this as a metaphor. Don't confuse it with hell and all that. It's the work that's being uh, tested here, if you will. Every man's work. Not the man, his work. Everyone before that throne is, is saved. The question is, what have you done for him? What, is, what has succeeded? What has, it, what has been your response to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Every man's work shall be made manifest. 
It'll be re revealed by fire. Then he goes on to explain. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If he, any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But again, to avoid any doctrinal confusion, the Holy Spirit adds a phrase here. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. In other words, like a refugee. And uh, so, notice it's man's work that's at issue here, not his personal position before the law. That's been taken care of with justification. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Yet Paul now says, you find Paul, as you read his writings, all through his writings, he was paranoid as can be in many respects. He says, I keep my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Wow, what on earth is Paul thinking of here? What's he panicked about? Losing his salvation? Of course not. He wrote the book on eternal security. It's called Romans chapter 8, among other places. But what he is concerned because if he's not diligent, if he's not faithful, there's a huge forfeiture involved. His inheritance is what he's talking about. And that's what most of us take for granted and yet should be the primary focus of our lives right now. And I'll explain why in a minute. In Hebrews chapter 3, for we are made partakers of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? The word partaker, the word is metakoi, one who shares in, a partner in an office worker dignity. Where we are made partner, partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So this implies there is a reward if we stick with it. Doesn't mean we lose our salvation, but we may lose our inheritance. There's a big word here. It's called if. If we hold. That's a conditional. So the main point I'm trying to get across here, before the Bema seat, we're not all going to be equal. We're all saved while we're there. Every one of us that are in Christ will be there together. But we will be measured on a spectrum of faithfulness from near zero to maximum, whatever that is. If we're on the low end of that scale, we're overtaken by the cares of this world. Uh, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of things distract us. We can go into the four soils and all that sort of thing. On the other hand... Uh, those that have been faithful are overcomers. And that's what we're trying to understand. Who are the overcomers? How do you become one? And we know that along the way here, there's five possible crowns we might earn. And we'll take a look at those in a minute. People on the left end of this spectrum, we typically call carnal Christians. They're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ indeed. But that's it. Their lives don't bear testimony to that. They, they, they aren't bearing fruit. They, they spend most of their time stumbling rather than achieving. And yet others uh, are on the right end of this scale. And they are, uh, they are driven by seven promises, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, detailed seven different promises uh, to them. And uh, so to eat of the tree of life, not heard of the second death, hidden man of the white stone, a new name is dealt with in chapter 2. Power over the nations, white raiment assured. And power over nations, see, what's... Part of what's involved here is our responsibilities and authorities in the kingdom that's coming. We're in boot camp. And our responsibilities in the kingdom will derive from our faithfulness in boot camp. Some will have power over the nations. There will be white raiment assured. Pillar and a new name. And to sit with Christ on his throne is among those things. Not necessarily for everyone. That's for the overcomers. And that's something we want to get across here. And, of course, the overcomers shall inherit all things in Revelation 21, big climax. There are five crowns that are detailed in the Scripture. I don't believe there's just five. That just happens to be five detailed. A crown of life for those who have suffered for his sake. Not for everybody, for those that have suffered. A crown of righteousness for those who loved his appearing. It's interesting that you get a crown if you love the doctrine of the rapture. Some people despise it or ignore it, what have you know, those that hold it dear get a special crown apparently, 2 Timothy 4, eight, The crown of glory for those who fed the flock. Hopefully that's most of us in some way or another. Crown incorruptible for those who press on steadfastly. And the crown of rejoicing for those who win souls. Now these are five that happen to be mentioned in the scripture. There may be, they may all be different names for the same one, possibly, or they could be five of ten that are available. Who knows? But there are five specific ones. That's our point here. Now, there are rewards for faithfulness, some entrusted with special privileges in the kingdom, some not. Some will reign with Christ, some not. That's why I often say that the, many Christians who get to heaven are going to be disappointed. 
Because they've been taught, we're all going to reign with Christ. No, some will, some won't. Doesn't mean you're not saved, but the ones that reign with him, the level of authority and so forth will be derived from their faithfulness. Some will be rich, some poor, some with heavenly treasures of their own and some not. Now, a couple caveats here so you don't get carried away. We're not under the law. Don't start making little lists of do's and do nots. That's in the flesh. We're not under the law. The Messiah is the fulfillment of the Torah for all of us. Let's not lose sight of that. In our enthusiasm to embrace the Old Testament, in our enthusiasm in trying to understand the feast of the prophetic uh, uh, significance, there's a, there's a wonderful romance that goes on. But be careful that you don't find yourself uh, ignoring the book of Galatians and so on. Avoid a works trip. We're not on a works trip. Works are of the flesh. You walk by the Spirit, not the flesh. That's what the whole book of the Galatians, which is like a short book of Romans, focuses on. Sin should not be reigning in your life anymore. It doesn't mean you won't stumble now and then, but you should, you should, there shouldn't be any addiction in your way. All of those things are uh, dealable. If you're an unbeliever, you're, a, you're in bondage to those things. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit at your disposal. You need to learn how to avail yourself of that. Sin need not reign in your life anymore. Walk with him. Don't get, fall behind. Don't get ahead of him. That's the trick, to step, stay in step with him. And that's, uh, that's a lifetime challenge. It's interesting, the Scripture talks about tears. I, I, I'm really haunted by this. In Revelation 7, for example, it says, The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them to the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. When I see that, I wonder, why should there be any tears? There's de no death, no sickness. Why should there be tears? In Revelation 21, at the big climax, God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There should be no more death, sorrow, crying, so forth. One of the things that I suspect is that uh, this is summarized to me by some words of Ralph Emerson. Of all the words of tongue or pen are these, of the saddest are these, it might have been. It's my suspicion that when we're at the judgment seat of Christ and we see our lives laid out and measured, I think we're going to be stunned to realize not just the places that we've stumbled, we're probably aware of most of those, but the time we've wasted, the things we might have done, the things that might have earned us a totally different eternity in the kingdom. If we really had a kingdom perspective now, I suspect our report card would read very differently. And that's the purpose of the book, The Kingdom, Power, and the Glory, our, what we call our Overcomers Handbook. That's the purpose of these studies is to stimulate you to do your own homework. Many of the things we're talking about have d many good scholars have different views on. And we're not here to sell you our view. That's not the point. We want to share with you why we hold the views we do, but our challenge here is for you to do your own homework and come to your own conclusions. It's too, you can't delegate this to somebody else. It's too important. You want to do your own homework. Jesus said in, in Revelation 3, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He's not talking about salvation. He's writing to the churches. It's talking about inheritance. And this is so important, we take this whole topic and we have a special study on that. Inheritance and rewards. The fact that in the Old and New Testament both, they can be lost. And you have an inheritance set aside for you that's beyond our imagining. And it's there for the earning. You can't earn your salvation, but you can earn rewards. That's what they're all about. Now there's a, a, an aspect to this that I'm sure will be quite controversial, but I just suggested to you to explore on your own. On the left side of the spectrum, we have those that are overtaken, what we sometimes call the carnal Christians. Who's on the right side, on the, the positive side of the spectrum? It's my suspicion, and I have to admit there's many good scholars that would not agree with me, but I, my suspicion, that's what we mean by the bride of Christ. I'm drawn to the view that the bride of Christ and the body of Christ are not synonyms that the bride of Christ is a select subset of the body that has earned the right to jointly reign with him. That's a suspicion. Don't accept it. Challenge it through your own study. But as we look at the order of events, after the Bema Seat of ju uh, Judgment, we have the marriage of the Lamb. Don't confuse the marriage of the Lamb with the marriage supper. 
You see, they're not the same thing. The marriage of the Lamb occurs in the Father's house. The marriage supper has present the Old Testament saints that are resurrected, and they're resurrected at the second coming. That tells you that the marriage supper is after the second coming. The marriage of the Lamb occurs before because he comes back with his bride. So those are separate. And there are very competent Hebrew scholars that will make that point, Arnold Fruchtenbaum being an example of those. The marriage takes place in the Father's house. The marriage supper takes place in the kingdom and includes the Old Testament saints resurrected at his second coming, including John the Baptist who called himself a friend of the bridegroom. He's an Old Testament saint. The law and the prophets were until John. So John will show up after the second coming, not at the rapture, apparently, if we, if we understand it correctly. Well, let's talk a little bit about these judgments. We've talked about the Bema seat judgment. There's another one called the sheep and goat judgment. And there's, of course, the big one at the end of the thousand years called the great white throne. Those three are often confused with each other. Let's be very precise and recognize they are distinct. You may have different views about some of the subtleties, but realize they are three different topics. The Bema Seat of Christ, that's about rewards, crowns, and assignments of responsibility in the kingdom. To the, we have a number of the kingdom parables, the talents, the virgins, the uninvited guests, all deal with issues there. The call of the bride to the marriage of the lamb may be part of that. It's my own suspicion that that's the big prize. That's the, that's the winning. That's the jackpot if you qualify to be categorized in the bride. The sheep and goat judgment, the more you study it, the more questions it raises because it's on the earth and three different parties are involved. The sheep, the goat, and his brethren. Mortals are judged. These are not resurrected. These are, these are mortal people being judged. And they're judged on the basis of works. Ooh, wow. That sure punctures the, the epistle of the Romans. Not exactly. At the end of the thousand years, that's when the unbelievers are judged. They're held in abeyance until then, at the end of the millennium. And that's when the, the great white throne, they are judged by their works. It's my own suspicion they're probably judged by their own standards. And they discover they fail those, but whatever. Clearly, that's a very, very awesome uh, event, the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. And after that comes a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem that it, 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 it challenges the imagination of our space artists in various ways. When the Lord comes back, there's another mystery that a lot of people have conjectures about. There are these 30 and 45 days after the second coming of Christ. What's all that about? Well, that all comes out of Daniel 12, the climactic chapter in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, that's talking about the abomination of desolation, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now it catches our eye because we're expecting twelve sixty, because each half of the seventy weeks is twelve hundred sixty days. However, from all this, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, which raises an issue: what's that extra thirty days for? Nobody knows. But it goes on. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. There's an additional 45 days you want to hang on through. So you've got 30 plus 45. What on earth is that all about? Let me be candid with you. Nobody knows. There are lots of conjectures. But anyway, the angel goes on. But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. In other words, don't sweat it, Daniel. Just record it and move on, okay? 1,290 days. 1,335 days. So what are these days? You see, I understand the problem is there's some event that isn't, it's, it's apparently, if we understand it right, after a second coming. What's going on there? One reasonable suggestion, that may be where the sheep and goat judgment's taken place. It isn't necessarily a pleasant time. He is back. He's got to set up his kingdom. So maybe it's somehow involved in that. But it's the real, the goal is to somehow weather it through for another 45 days. Blessed is he that makes it to the 1,335 days. What might that be? All kinds of guesses. All kinds of guesses. And uh, no, clear, no clear teaching, but it's, we we're alerted to that, alerted to the possibilities. But exactly what they involve is, is strictly one of conjecture. And it's very important. It's not a problem to be indulging in conjectures. Just keep them distinct. What we really know and what we surmise. Two different things altogether. 
So we have no idea what goes on between those two, but we know it's a blessing to make it to the 1335. So it sounds like it could include the sheep and goat judgments. It could include the establishment of the temple and all that sort of thing. But the temple, we haven't talked about that, but that's a big issue here. Is it historical? Ezekiel has, uh, from chapter 40 to 48, he's got uh, nine chapters there that deal with the millennium and the temple. It doesn't fit anything historic. Trying to make it fit history is a waste. It, it, trust me, it just doesn't fit. Is it the third temple? If we, if we call Herod's temple and Nehemiah's temple and all that, we lump that together and call it, as scholastically we usually we call that the second temple. Um, there is a temple anticipated because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it. So we'll call that, for lack of another term, the third temple. But its destiny is to be defiled by the Antichrist. So is Ezekiel's temple fit that? No, it doesn't. Is Ezekiel's temple just an allegory? Many people, the, the, the traditional church view is that it's just some kind of allegory. It is so detailed that um, the, the idea of it just being a metaphor really evaporates as, uh, in absurdity. Could it refer to the church? No, that's a contradiction in terms. No, is it a fourth temple? I'll put it, use that term. In other words, a temple that succeeds after the third temple. And that, of course, is our view for a lot of reasons. The millennial temple. The description of the temple is so highly detailed in those nine chapters. It gives you the thickness of the walls and the number of steps and all that business. It can't be symbolic. That would, that would, God's word is pure. God doesn't play games in that sense. He's straightforward. All nations are going to worship there. This isn't just a Jewish thing. All nations are going to worship there. But here's the one that bothers everybody. The offerings and sacrifices are resumed. Wow, does that upset the animal rights people and also a lot of theologians. Interesting observation, by the way. It's open only on Shabbat, that's Saturday, and the new moons. It's a very Jewish thing in this styling. And that shatters people who say, well, the Sunday is our Sabbath. No, Sunday is, you can... You can celebrate the Lord on his resurrection day, no problem. But don't, can, don't assume that Sunday is Saturday. That's mixing metaphors. The temple in the millennium is going to only be open on Shabbat and the new moons. Now, if we look at, if we take a quick snapshot of architecture here, you remember the tabernacle. Um, I'm, I've aligned this so east is at the bottom. And it was 75 feet by 150 feet, which gives it the perimeter of Noah's Ark, but that's neither important. It's all in cubits, but we'll assume for this diagram a cubit is a foot and a half to, get, to keep, let's stay out of those arguments. As you go through this door, you encounter the altar of sacrifice and then the laver, and then you end to the holy place itself, the, the naus, the, the, the tabernacle proper. And, uh, and as we look at that more specifically, we discover that uh, there, it's, called, there's, it's too sections, the holy place and the holy of holies. And as you enter this, you, on the left is the menorah, the, the lampstand, seven branch lampstand. And on the right, you have the table of showbread. And then you have the golden altar, which is in front of, but associated with the holy of holies. That confuses many people. It's not in the holy of holies. It has to be tended day and night. So it has to be outside because no one can go in there except the high priest. And he can only go in once a year on Yom Kippur. And here, of course, we have two things, not one. We have the Ark of the Covenant and we have the Mercy Seat. And the Holy of Holies is defined by the presence of the Mercy Seat, interestingly enough. And they're always described separately. We have a tendency to lump them together because we visualize the Mercy Seat as the lid. But they're always described separately and that's, we want to be careful that our myopia doesn't cloud an insight here. And Jesus Christ made claim to each one of these. As I am the door, whoever comes in other than by me is a thief and a robber. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He makes intercession. That's what the golden altar is. It's the prayers of the saints. He's our sin bearer and he's our propitiation for our sins. And that's, that's the, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that's his, every detail of the tabernacle, the materials, the sizes, every detail speaks of Jesus Christ directly. But uh, when we get to... Uh, the, uh, uh, the temple, it has the same architecture the tabernacle did. We have the holy, holies, the holy place. Then we have in the, in the temple that Solomon built, we have not one table. We've got a whole bunch of them, 10 of, ten, ten ta ten ta of those and 10 lampstands. And then we have an inner court and we have the Holocaust altar. The all that's patterned after the tabernacle, just bigger. And uh, 
then uh, we have an outer court, and we have a couple other. We have a couple of things in the temple that was not in the tabernacle. The porch is a new addition, and we have two pillars that don't hold up anything, but they're extremely important. Yachin and they have names, Yachin and Boaz. So they have a role too. I'm not going to go through it. This is just by way of perspective. We also have these very strange storage, personal storage uh, uh, places for the priests. And uh, they're wood. They're not uh, interesting enough. And there's a whole uh, uh, understanding that can derive from this because we are the temple of God. We're told that seven times. So our, our architecture is detailed here in a way that's worth your study. So I encourage you to get our materials on the architecture of man or my wife's book, The Way of Agape and Be Transformed, which deals with applying that architecture to our very lives. The Millennial Temple is what we're really dealing with. It consists of three terraces, on the highest of which, facing east, stands the temple with its annexes, the temple yard, and a large building directly behind it. In the middle terrace are kitchens and chambers for priests, the court containing the altar burnt offering, and the inner courts with three elaborate porticos. And then the lowest terrace, surrounded by an exterior wall, contains the outer courts with three porticos and kitchens and chambers for the people. And so I'm turning on the side because it's easier to draw it that way. But uh, the basic architecture is obviously recognizable from what, what's gone on before, and except it's bigger. And we have uh, chambers for the singers. And we have uh, priest chambers on either side. And then we have uh, priest kitchens over there. And we have even, it gets even bigger because we have the inner gates and then we have the outer gates. And uh, all these are detailed in the thickness of the walls and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a study to get into for yourself on that. And then we have the chambers of the outer court and uh, where the worshipers can, can uh, participate in the various activities. And uh, we have the people's kitchen. You see, we had special kitchens for the priests. On the outer court, we have special kitchens for the people. And so we also have outer gates. And it's interesting that we have the darkness that's outside in the Greek that is mentioned in three of the kingdom parables. A widely misunderstood phrase. It's not dealing with hell as we, we when we, the, 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 you know, the outer darkness is not an idiom of Sheol or Hades, as we would jump to the conclusion, it turns out not to be. And it's amazing that most of the, a large barrage of conservative scholars have come to recognize that. It's the darkness that's outside. And that, and uh, so anyway, let's get back to these sacrifices. Everybody's upset about that. These animal sacrifices in the Old Testament never took away sin. Only the sacrifice of Christ can do that. They were operative in that they pointed to the ultimate sacrifice. In the Old Testament, Times Israelites were saved by grace through faith, and the sacrifice helped restore a believer's fellowship with God. After, even after the church began, Jewish believers did not hesitate to take part in temple worship, even to offer sacrifice in Acts 21 as an example. They could do this because they viewed the sacrifice as memorials of Christ's death. So the, the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament were memorials in advance, the sacrifices subsequently are memorials after the fact. But only the, the, uh, the, the epistle to Hebrews hammers this home. And uh, so we need to understand that. The millennial sacrifice will differ from Levitical sacrifices, though there are some similarities. In fact, when you go to Ezekiel 45, there are so many things there that are non-Levitical. The book of Ezekiel almost didn't make it into the canon. They couldn't understand why it was so different. And fortunately, it was included. And each of those differences are very, very significant to study. And uh, by the way, there are other passages also that refer to sacrifices in the millennium. In Isaiah 56 and 66, Jeremiah 33, Zechariah 14, Malachi 3, and on it goes. So there's something else about the temple architecture that's a mystery that uh, most people even miss, and the few that do understand it are confused by it. There is a space called the Gizra, a separate place. Most scholars presume it's a building there on the west side of the complex. There are a few, Matthew Henry and a few others, that recognize from the language it may not be that building, it may be the space next to the building. But exactly what it is and what it's for is an a, a, a avenue of study that we talk about in the book. I won't try to get into here, just alert you that that's an interesting issue that will surface. 
But let's talk about the land. You know, God promised Abraham and his descendants the land of Palestine, as we call it today. And that promise has never been rescinded. Israel's experiencing blessing in the land was conditioned upon her obedience, but her right to possess the land was never been revoked, despite what Islam is trying to sell here. When God inaugurates the new covenant with Israel in the future, he will be, yeah, she will be restored to her place of blessing in the land. That's in Ezekiel 36 and 37, which is the prelude in Zechariah 38 and 39. To prepare the people for this new occupation, God defined the boundaries of the country. Israel's borders during the millennium will be similar to those promised her during the time of Moses in Numbers 34. Let's take a look at the holy district. We talked about the temple. That's in the middle of a huge plot of land. That's the temple. The temple is not in Jerusalem. There are living quarters for the sons of Zadok, nor are the Levites. The Levites don't officiate as priests. They officiate, but in a demoted way. It's the sons of Zadok that are going to be the, the, uh, the, the priests there. Jerusalem is a substantial distance to the south. And there's food growing properties on both sides of that. There's a, part, there's a portion for the prince. Who is the prince? That's a good question. Is it Jesus Christ? Don't think so. Is it the high priest? Not exactly. Christ is our high priest. So an interesting study I'll leave to you to dig out when you study the book of Ezekiel. Try to figure out who the priests are who the prince is, and what role does David have, and what role does Jesus himself have in terms of how they access and leave the temple and so forth. But there's also this river that comes out from under the temple, flows to Jerusalem, then splits to the Mediterranean to the west and to the Dead Sea on the east. And uh, so the topography of the land will be materially changed. This is not heaven. This is the kingdom from heaven on the earth that we're dealing with. Now, we take that same parcel of ground and we discover that the 12 tribes inherit. North, we have Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, Manasseh, Naphtali, Asher, Dan going northward. And to the south, we have Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad going to the south. There are the 12 tribes allocated their land. Showing this on a map to give you another feeling for this, we have that same thing. This, different scholars see this slightly differently from the text, but this is basically pretty much a synopsis of what most conservative scholars visualize the text saying. And uh, so for what it's worth. Now, so we've gone through one of several studies supporting this book. But I'm going to finish this, wrap this up with a strange way, because I want to excerpt a foreword that was written for the book by uh, Dr. William Welty, who is the executive director for the ISV Foundation, who makes a very distinctive point about the book that is really the point I'm trying to make anyway in this study here. William says, John must have been puzzled. Exiled to the lonely island of Patmos, he had just begun to receive what will become known as the most elevated vision of things to come given to any person in the history of planet Earth. The vision begins with a resurrected immortal Jesus of Nazareth dictating seven letters for delivery to the pastors of seven churches that existed during the latter half of the first century. With eyes of flames like fire and feet like bronze that glows in a furnace, the God-man, who was once dead and is now alive forevermore, is ill. No wonder John was pu- you know, pu- uh, puzzled here. Bluntly speaking, the immortal man is about ready to vomit. How can it be that an immortal being can apparently become so unwell as to puke? Call call the dictated letter eschatological symbolism, if you will. Label it literary allegory. Or classify it as apocalyptic literature influenced by Jewish visions of the end of the world from the time between the Old New Testaments. You can even think of the story as mere literary license. It really doesn't matter what name we use to describe the event because the reality of the letter to the church of Laodicea is that Jesus is sick of lukewarm Christianity. He's about to vomit. He writes the Apostle John in Revelation 3, verses 14 to 17. I'll do it in the ISV. To the messenger of the church in Laodicea, write the amen, the witness who is faithful and true, the originator of God's creation, says this. I know your actions that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Since you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. That's Jesus Christ talking. 
You say, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I don't need anything. Yet you don't realize that you are miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Bluntly speaking, the Jesus of Nazareth is sick of the lukewarm, useless Christian lifestyles. But he doesn't leave the Laodicean pastor without a solution to the problem. Therefore, I advise you to buy from me gold purified in fire so that you might be rich. White clothes to wear so that your shameful nakedness won't show. An ointment to put on your eyes so you may see. I correct and discipline those whom I love. So be serious and repent. Look, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. And he will eat with me. To the one who conquers... I will give a place to sit with me on my throne, just as I have conquered and have sat down with my Father on his throne. Let everyone listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the close of William's quote. He continues here. As I write the words of this forward on a rainy, blustery day, wintry day in early 2009, here in Southern California, the United States of America and the world in which it exists is entering the most terrifying time in history. The economies of virtually every nation on earth are collapsing. Unwise American politicians are creating dollars out of thin air, voting into existence more than a trillion dollars merely by agreeing to loan them to businesses that would otherwise have been reorganized through the discipline of the bankruptcy courts and the free enterprise business realities. Meanwhile, the whole Western world that only six months ago was saying, I am rich and I've become wealthy and don't need anything, is now about to find out from personal experience, what it will mean to hear the third horseman of the apocalypse cry out, a quart of wheat for a denarius, or three quarts of barley for a denarius. All of this trouble comes on a world from a God who loves us and who corrects and disciplines those whom he loves. And that's why this message is going to be your roadmap through the times of trouble that are about to refine God's children and judge all of God's enemies. The counsel contained in this remarkable volume will explain what the life of faith is intended by its author to lead to, which is divinely ordered preparation for the rulership in the coming kingdom. May these readers learn to be firmly entrenched overcomers who have no need of exhortation. May we not be the cowardly ones who bury their talents in the ground, wrongly convinced that the God whom we serve reaps where he doesn't sow. Meanwhile, the ancient words of a centuries-old poem haunt me. They're carved in a Gothic medieval alphabet on a towering, ornate cathedral's door right in the heart of a small town in Germany. Translated into modern English, the words take the form of a frightening poem. Here is what the poem says. You call me eternal, then do not seek me. You call me fair, then do not love me. You call me gracious, then do not trust me. You call me just, and then do not fear me. You call me life, then do not choose me. You call me light, then do not see me. You call me Lord, then do not respect me. You call me master, and then do not obey me. You call me merciful, then do not thank me. You call me mighty, and then do not honor me. You call me noble, and then do not serve me. You call me rich, and then do not ask me. You call me Savior, and then do not praise me. You call me Shepherd, then do not follow me. You call me Way, and then do not walk with me. You call me Wise, then do not heed me. You call me the Son of God, and then do not worship me. When I condemn you, do not blame me. May we all allow God to carry us on to maturity and fitness for ruling as kings and queens in the coming kingdom as we rightly respond to the circumstances and adversaries, uh, adversities of this present life, which are not worthy to be compared to the glories which shall one day be revealed in us. So that's William's forward. It's excerpted from it. But it's so to, on the mark. See, that this message of the kingdom is precisely the missing message that the church today, we are in the Laodicean period. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, if we look at the seven letters, seven churches, we discover every detail in those letters is skillfully designed. The very name that Jesus uses of the, of, the, of the church turns out to be relevant to its key message. The title that Jesus chooses of himself is different for each one, selected to fit that particular mission. 
The lessons, have, the, each of the le uh, letters have a commendation, some concerns, and then enclosed with an exhortation. It's interesting that two of the letters have nothing to commend them. There's no good said. Everyone else has some good news, some bad news. Two of them have nothing good said about them. Laodicea, of course, is one of them. So is Sardis. It's interesting to understand who, they, who that's dealing with. Their couple have nothing bad said about them. No concerns. Smyrna and Philadelphia come out pretty good on this thing. And, of course, they all have exhortations. We notice something architectural about the letters that's very strange. Each one closes with a promise to the overcomer. Now, well, each one closes with a, a closing phrase. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In the first three of these, the promise to the overcomer is a postscript. It's outside the body of the letter for some reason. In the last four, the, the promise to the overcomer is part of the body of the letter. What does that mean? All it tells us is there apparently there's two distinctives here. For some reason, there's the first three and the last four partitioned. So as we study this, we discover that those letters strangely in the order that they're presented, lay out a history of the church. If they were in any other order, this would not be true. But it turns out that the first Ephesus is a letter to the apostolic church, Smyrna to the persecuted church, Pergamus to the married church, where it married the world, okay? Thyatira, the medieval church, Sardis, the denominational church, typically associated with the Reformation, Philadelphia, the, uh, uh, the missionary church, and Laodicea, the apostate church. Where are we on this spectrum? And your, 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 your second guess doesn't count. <laughs> now, we know so architecturally the first three are grouped together. Their promises are subscripted. Don't know why. The last four, the promises are in the body of the letter. And we also notice something else. The last four contain an explicit reference to the second coming. So in some sense, these last four profile the church in the end times. We know that one of these four, the first of the four, has an explicit promise that if they don't change, they're going into the Great Tribulation. That tells you that if they do change, they won't. That's kind of interesting. One of these four has an explicit promise that they will be taken out before the time of the Great Tribulation. The other couple are rather problematical. Now, the one we're interested in, of course, is the one that characterizes the church today. Anyone with any spiritual sensitivity to what's going on in the world church recognizes the church today is astonishingly destitute of the gospel. And we are clearly in, in, in days of apostasy. What makes that significant to us, not only being a challenge to us as, as uh, ambassadors of our king, but it also tells us where we are in the timeline. We're down to the finishing strokes here. So that's why we want to understand how to be a winner. Another insight, you know, I, I, I've expressed earlier, our hermeneutics determines our eschatology. In other words, depending on what your theory of interpretation is, determines what you conclude eschatologically. If you take a very high view of inspiration, if you take the Bible very, very literally, you're driven to the right side of that spectrum, you're pre-trib, pre-millennial. If you're willing to allegorize, treat it all just symbolically, you can drift over on the left side. And that's where, of course, most traditional denominations are. In other words, our, our belief about Interpreting, interpreting the Bible will determine your eschatology. But here's the surprise. Your eschatology, your view about end times, will refi refine your view about the church. The myst not the organized physical church. I'm talking about the mystical spiritual church. Your ecclesiology will be determined by your eschatology. And that's what we just saw through. As you go, if you understand the history of the church in spiritual terms as laid out by Jesus himself in those seven letters, the seven epistles that are overlooked by most people who look at epistles, uh, we learn a lot about what the church really is or should be. Well, what's interesting, your ecclesiology then also determines your hermeneutics because that will determine how, whether you lean on the raw text, the, 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 the original text, or whether you're dealing, willing to deal with paraphrases. And so, in any case, Christ is at the center of all three of these things, but it fascinates me to see that there's a spiral. As you improve your hermeneutics, it'll improve your eschatology, which will improve your understanding of the church, which will improve your hermeneutics, and you are on either an upward spiral or a downward spiral, depending on how you treat those things. So we have other resources. They're all kind. My wife has DVDs supporting the practical aspects of some, many of these things, and of course we have the studies you're participating in here. And of course we have expositional commentaries in depth on Matthew, I encourage you to go through it if you haven't. Then Romans and Hebrews, which are the two great pillars of doctrine. And then, of course, Ezekiel gives you a great deal of perspective of the millennium. 
And the epistle of Ephesians gives you the armor of God, which is a critical aspect of becoming an overcomer. There are other references, the kingdom, the power, and the glory, of course, are, are, are basic text here. But eternal security by uh, Charles Stanley is an excellent treatment on that subject. And the reign of the servant kings was one of the books that really woke my wife and up many years ago to the realities that have been overlooked, we feel, in much of the doctrinal materials that we've been brought up on. But your challenge, I always want to close on this, your challenge, and if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. This is too important to accept my word. I want you to challenge what I'm going to put on the screen here. You and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement, that we're moving into a time period about which the Bible says more than the gospel period. That sounds crazy. Check it out. First of all, you've got to find out what the Bible really says, not what some radio or TV guy says. You need to find out yourself. It's too important to delegate to anyone else. And we have a unique environment today. You can find out more in a few minutes that would take a pastor 10 years ago two weeks to dig into with all the tools that are available and they're free or virtually free. The advanced information appliances. Many people have five or six Bibles in their phone and the internet resources. You can find out anything if you know how to use that powerful tool. And the role of small groups. If you're not in a small group, I'm worried about you because I don't think you can learn your Bible in a 45-minute sermon once a week. If you're not, you, you should be in a small study group. There are different kinds. There are neighborhood groups. Sometimes there's groups of professionals, doctors or lawyers that get together Thursday for breakfast or whatever. But you should be in a systematic study of the Bible in a small group. Small enough groups so that you can ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough to hold each other accountable. Check it out. You can't find one, start one. We'll help you. Then the second part of the challenge isn't just what the Bible says. The second part is find out what's going on. You won't on the second you know, on the 10 o'clock news. Pilate asked that rhetorical question at the crucifixion. What is truth? That's our challenge today. We live in an era that denies the existence of truth. We live in the age of deceit. We need to understand what tools are available so you can find out, so you can be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and knew what their country had to do. So what is your action plan? You've heard a couple of DVDs now and you've you may have some feelings about it. The real issue, what's your action as a result? What is God calling you to do? I often ask an audience, how many of you are saved? And all the hands go up. Great, what have you done with it? God saved you for a purpose, not just to glorify his name in broad brush. He, he, he saved you for a specific mission. And the greatest adventure of life is to discover what it is he's calling you to. So raise the bar in your own personal walk with him. And that will include, not be limited to, but certainly will not... Uh, overlook a, a commit to a systematic pr uh, program to study your Bible. Well, I read it every day. That's devotional. I'm talking about a serious study. Join or, uh, or start a, a small study group. But whatever it is you do, do it deliberately. Respond to his calling now. Now, there is a resource that I want you to be aware of. Uh, we have a, a think tank. It's a worldwide lifetime fellowship you can join. It's non-denominational, but it's very fundamental. It's a supplement, not a replacement for church. I don't care where you, you are. I take for granted you're active in a local church. And many people are thrilled with the Institute because it relieves, it gives them a, an avenue of serious study uh, while they still can maintain the fellowship in places that they've gotten very comfortable in. And you do all this on your own clock. You don't have to sign up for a course where you have to be, some, be, on, uh, be available from 9 to 10 on Tuesdays. That, no, no. It will take a couple hours a week to go through a program. But you can do it at 4 in the morning, midnight, whenever you, during the year, during the whole week, when you've got a couple of hours, you can be taking that course. You'll be in a virtual fellow, you'll be in a virtual classroom with 11 other people that you'll get to know, and those people will be from any of 35 different countries in the world. It's a voluntary think tank for Christians. If you're, if you're a serious Christian, this may be something that uh, you need to know about. And it's committed to supporting your calling, whatever it is. We wouldn't presume to know what your calling is, but whatever it is as it emerges, we'll covenant to help you achieve that, whatever it might be. So don't confuse our publishing activity called Koinonia House, who you're probably acquainted with. Chaos.org is his website. Different activity, the think tank, Coin Institute. Different website, studycenter.com. And it has three avenues of study. It's not just Bible studies. Our primary thing is a commitment to what we call the Berean track. It's motivated by our trademark for over 30 years, Acts 1711. But it, what makes it different than a Bible Institute is a second avenue of study. We call it the Issachar track to understand the times and that has to do with prophecy and stewardship. 
And the doing is the, uh, where the rubber meets the road. And it's motivated by the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Which we argue has nothing to do with vocabulary. It has to do with ambassadorship. If you're going to be an ambassador for the king, you need to be able to represent him competently and faithfully. Now, one of the resources you'll discover if you get into the, you know, on campus here, there is a, a worldwide intelligence uh, um, network. We call it the Issachar Database. It's fed by a worldwide surveillance network. It also is fed by proprietary sources. All, the ma all of the major uh, uh, subscription services are fed into it. And also, the most powerful part of it are member presentations. As members interact with that database, it creates products that are also available to the membership. And so, I won't get into all that here except find out what that's about because you may discover it's one of the most important sources of information for the challenges you're going to be facing over the coming months and years. How can you get involved with this think tank? Well, first of all, undertake a lifelong learning program of biblical studies. Commit yourself to doing that. No matter how much you think you know, there's people that will join you in learning more. And you can volunteer. We have if you take a class, you'll have a live person coaching you to completion. Those are volunteers. We call them teaching assistants. There are area representatives throughout the world. When we take a trip across, we're about to embark on a 16-city tour around the world, we'll have area reps, you know, with our people organized in each of those locations. And we have research assistants. Those are our eyes and ears. People, either because of professional qualifications or proximity to the centers of influence, are our eyes and ears that feed the database. And we have information retrieval specialists that focus on our surveillance sectors that we're uh, monitoring. And we, you can also, if you're interested, uh, sponsor special programs, prizes, incentives, practicums, internships, endowments for more courses, and so forth. That's who we are. God bless you. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the uh, extremes that you've gone to that we might live. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your word and that word that became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you for the gift of your son that we might live. We also thank you for the Holy Spirit to open our understanding to these things. We pray, Father, that you would reignite in each of us a new passion, a new hunger for your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that we each might be more effective stewards of the opportunities that you're going to bring before our path in the days ahead. As we commit ourselves into your hands, asking you, Father, to have your purpose in each of our lives achieved, what you have for us. Show us, guide us, empower us as we commit ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King, our kinsman Redeemer, in whose name we do pray. Amen.